We're going to count down the top 15 most bizarre ancient sports, starting with number 15, Ulama. Ulama is a traditional ball game that's been played in Mesoamerica since the times of the ancient Olmecs from around 3,500 years ago. Usually associated with the Maya and Aztec civilizations, it was far more than just a game. It was a major cornerstone of society. Depending on the region and the time period, the rules of Ulama varied, but the game usually involved teams using their hips to launch a very heavy rubber ball across a playing field. The object was to keep the ball in play and, in some cases, to pass it through a stone hoop located high on the court walls, some of which can still be seen at archaeological sites today. Due to the weight of the ball, which could be as much as 9 pounds, along with the physical demands of the game, Ulama required great skill and strength. The courts were known as Tlachtli and were so important to the people of the time that they were often built as central architectural features in major cities. The walls and floors were decorated with iconography and inscriptions, sometimes even depicting a ball game as a narrative of celestial events, tying it to stories of the gods, creation, and the cycle of life and death. With the sport being seen as intertwined with mythology and religion, the game was hugely symbolic and it was sometimes even used as a way to resolve disputes. It was so important that in some cultures there was also a sacrificial element too, with players from the losing or the winning sides seeing it as a great honor to offer their lives in tribute to the gods at the end of the game. In an attempt to connect with the past, Ulama is still played in some parts of Mexico, but of course, the more extreme elements remain consigned to history. Number 14. Camel Jumping now, when you think of horse jumping, you likely imagine a race with fences that the horse and jockey have to navigate. But in camel jumping, things couldn't be more different. A traditional sport that's been popular for hundreds of years in the Zaranik tribe of the Tahama region of Yemen, it's believed to have begun during a dispute over the ownership of a camel between two tribesmen. Essentially, camel jumping involves the participants leaping over rows of camels that have been lined up side by side, showing athleticism and agility of the athletes, and also serving as a rite of passage. The jumpers have to run towards a line of camels and leap over them without the help of any tools or equipment, with the number of camels varied based on the competition and the skill level of the competitors, although there's usually between three to five camels. With adult males growing up to 7 feet or 2 meters at their shoulder, this is no easy task and makes a record of 6 camels being cleared from a barefoot jump all the more impressive. Jumpers will normally approach at a full sprint and then use a strong and well-timed leap to propel themselves over the animals. The timing is said to be absolutely critical and would allow for successful jumpers to clear the camels entirely, landing gracefully on the other side. As well as being a competitive and physically demanding sport, camel jumping is often performed during festive occasions such as weddings and religious festivals. It is certainly quite the spectacle, and despite beginning as a regional sport, it has more recently gained international attention because of its uniqueness, and it's shown a different side to Yemeni culture. Number 13. Pelota Parapecha Pelota Parapecha is a ball game native to the Parapecha people of the state of Miyawakan in Mexico. The traditional sport was being played long before the Spanish arrived and had a deep meaning for the Parapecha community far beyond just being for fun. Unlike many other ball games from the continent, Pelota Parapecha does not involve a rubber ball or stone hoops. Instead, it's played with a solid wooden ball, which players strike with sticks, aiming it to move it across the opponent's goal line. There's a variant that ups the stakes even more called Pelota Tarasca, and for this, the ball is doused and set alight, making it particularly popular at nighttime where it creates an incredible spectacle. The field for this game is rectangular, similar to a soccer field, but without boundaries, meaning the ball can be played over a wider area. Teams range from just a few players to much larger groups, and the objective is simple. Teams must get the ball to their opponent's end of the field and prevent it from crossing their own goal line. Often played during festivals, community celebrations, and religious observances, it, like many other Mesoamerican ball games, was also used to resolve conflicts between communities instead of fighting. With such historical and cultural importance, efforts have been made to continue the sport to this day, with tournaments and leagues being set up to encourage younger generations to learn it and connect with the past. Number 12. Pancration Translating to mean all powers, pancration was an ancient Greek martial art blending boxing and wrestling, and in many ways it was the precursor to modern MMA. First introduced in the Olympic Games in the year 646 BCE, it was as close to being the toughest sport of all, and with the only rules being you're not allowed to bite or gouge, it was particularly brutal. 
The sport developed a unique combat system which included strikes with hands and feet, joint locks, and choke holes. The aim was to subdue the opponent either by forcing them to submit to a lock or a choke or by incapacitating them with strikes. Matches took place in a sandy pit at the Olympic Games to provide a limited space, which helped contain the action and protect the spectators. The fighters were called pancreationists and were highly respected athletes who trained full-time to develop the strength, agility, endurance, and tactics needed to succeed. Many of the various techniques from pancration are depicted in ancient Greek artworks, showing just how popular a sport it was. With minimal rules, pancration matches often ended in severe injuries, but this wasn't the main goal. Instead, the competitors wanted to show their skill, their bravery, and mastery over their opponents, and proved to be so effective that the training methods used in the sport would eventually be taught to Greek soldiers, including the famous Spartan warriors, to give them an edge in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Number 11. Unguni Stick Fighting with its origins tracing back thousands of years, Nguni stick fighting is a traditional martial art that's practiced among the Nguni people of southern Africa, particularly with the Zulu, Xhosa, Ndebele, and Swazi communities. It's a form of combat that's believed to have developed from techniques used to herd livestock, and it's now deeply embedded into the cultural fabric, serving not only as a method of self-defense but also as a sport and a rite of passage for young men. Each fight involves two opponents who have two sticks, one that's used for striking and a smaller one known as the shield which is used for defense. The aim is to outmaneuver and strike your opponent while avoiding being hit back, with the sticks being made from hard indigenous wood so they can withstand a huge amount of force without splintering. Traditionally, Unguni stick fighting starts from a young age and plays a huge role in the upbringing of boys in rural communities. Far from simply learning how to fight, there's also a huge focus on discipline, respect, agility, strategy, and endurance. It did, though, become a training method for warfare, too, with the best stick fighters usually being the most effective warriors on the battlefield. In modern times, while it's now less common in the daily lives of communities, stick fighting remains a respected tradition. It also appears in celebrations and tourism presentations where it helped give an insight into the traditions of Southern Africa. This helps maintain the relevance and appeal of the sport, meaning that the art form remains without the same level of risk. Number 10. Chunky Chunky, which is also known as Chenko, is a game played by Native American cultures, particularly by the Mississippian peoples, as far back as 1400 years ago. As with many sports at the time, it's much more than just a game. It had a deep social and ceremonial importance, too. The basic principle of Chunky is that it involves a stone disc called the Chunky Stone, which is rolled along the ground. Players have to throw spears or sticks towards the rolling stone with the aim of landing their spear the closest to the point where the stone will eventually stop. The stones themselves were carefully crafted, normally made from polished discs of stone that could range from a few inches to over a foot or several centimeters to a third of a meter in diameter, and were decorated with etchings or carvings. The game would be played on a specially prepared mound which was usually a flattened stretch of earth around 200 feet long. The game required huge physical skill for throwing but also a great aptitude for judgment and precision in predicting the Rolling Stones path, meaning it was equal parts physicality as intellect, helping athletes hone their strategy, foresight, and physical prowess. The popularity of Chunky spread across a wide area, from the Cahokia Mounds in modern Illinois to other parts of the Mississippian culture, including parts of the Southeast and Midwest. Socially and politically, Chunky games were significant events that could attract huge gatherings and would offer opportunities for leaders from different tribes to forge alliances. The outcome of games could also have serious consequences, with high-stakes gambling often taking place between spectators and players. It was not uncommon, for example, for players to wager personal belongings, food reserves, or even their own freedom on their performance. A large number of chunky stones have been found at sites, and iconography and artifacts alongside them have helped further understand this ancient Mississippian art. It's still played today, but mainly as a way to highlight the practices of communities from the region and to demonstrate the cultural depth. Number 9. Kabaddi most modern combat sports see individuals compete against one another, but Kabaddi is a little different. Originating in the Indian subcontinent thousands of years ago, it's a team sport that combines elements of tag, wrestling, and strategy. Played on a rectangular court with each team occupying half of the space, a match consists of two 20-minute halves, during which teams alternate between offense and defense. Now, what's unique about the way it's played is that the offensive player, known as the Raider, must hold their breath while chanting Kabaddi, Kabaddi continuously as they attempt to tag as many opposing defenders as possible and return to their half of the court without being tackled. 
This gets trickier as the defenders coordinate to stop the raider without breaking their chain of formation. Successful raids and tackles score points, making the game hugely competitive and physically demanding. The requirement for raiders to hold their breath, known as the can't, adds a psychological element, which further tests the endurance and willpower alongside physical agility. Experts think it was once practiced as a form of battlefield tactic, and that over time it evolved into a structured sport. Today, kabaddi is celebrated in various forms across different regions, with major styles including the standard style, which is played on a rectangular court, and the circle style, which is played on a circular field. It is now highly regarded, and there's a kabaddi world cup and a professional league like the Pro Kabaddi League in India, which have put the sport onto the world stage. Having featured in the 1936 Olympics, it played far beyond South Asia, with countries like Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia all having active kabaddi communities that take part in international competitions. Number 8. Shin Kicking So the UK claims to have invented a number of the world's most popular sports, such as soccer, rugby, and cricket. But there's one you don't often hear about, Shin Kicking. Originating as far back as the early 17th century and competed every year in Gloucestershire, England during the Cotswold Olympic Games, it's just as ridiculous and brutal as the name suggests, but it's surprisingly a deep part of local tradition. This isn't exactly the most complicated of sports to understand, but it can be hugely challenging, and everyone who takes part has their own technique and approach. Competitors, known as the Shin Kickers, face off in a series of bouts where the objective is to bring an opponent to the ground using a combination of balance, strength, and strategic kicking. The matches are overseen by a referee, often called the Stickler, whose job is to ensure fair play and keep score throughout the rounds. The sport usually takes place in a small, marked-out field, ensuring that competitors are kept close. Modern shin kickers wear traditional white lab coats, which are an ode to the historical attire, and also a practical uniform that makes it easier to grab one another during tussles. They stuff their trousers with straw, providing a form of padding against the relentless kicks being aimed at their shins. But no matter what you do, it's gonna hurt, meaning the test is not only one of strength, but one of strategy and pain resistance. The rules state that competitors must hold on to each other's collars and attempt to knock their opponent off balance. The kicks, while forceful, are regulated to target only the shins, and the winner of the bout is determined when one competitor brings the other to the ground. Each match is best out of three falls, with the loser left questioning why things went so wrong. Often said to be one of the world's strangest sports, the annual shin-kicking tournament brings competitors and spectators across from the UK and further afield. Things aren't taken as seriously as you'd expect from most other sports, with it instead serving as a celebration of local customs and giving visitors a chance to see other events and tradition that the region is also known for. Moving on to number 7, Buzkashi. Buzkashi, which translates to mean goat pulling, is a traditional equestrian sport native to Central Asia. Still seen today as the national sport of Afghanistan, it's believed to be many centuries old, possibly evolving from the nomadic tribe's need to handle and protect livestock from predators or thieves. The game is played on a large, open field and involves players on horseback known as the Champandanzan, who compete to grab a goat or calf carcass from the ground and then ride to place it in a designated goal area called the Circle or the Raihan. The carcass used in Bukashi is prepared, such by filling the limbs with sand and swelling them up to stop them from falling apart during the game. Matches can range from a relatively structured competition in formal settings, complete with teams and defined rules, to a more chaotic and individual-focused contest in rural areas. In team versions, players work together to protect the rider carrying the carcass while blocking opponents from snatching it away. Athletes have to be highly skilled horse riders, often training at a young age to master not just control but also the strength and tactical knowledge needed for this sport. It's a hugely social event that draws large crowds from far and wide and acts as a celebration of tradition of nomadic skills, a display of courage, and a means of gaining social prestige. Today, Buzkashi is still extremely popular and gives a connection to the Central Asian heritage, although the sport has been modernized in a number of ways. There are now more rules to ensure safety and organization with formal leagues and international matches that aim to promote it to a global audience. Number 6. Venetian Bridge Battles When you visit Venice, you can't miss the elaborate bridges that cross the canals. Most visitors will see these as necessary ways to move around the city by foot, but for Venetians, they've been long the site of one of the most important traditions, and to what outsiders is a truly bizarre sport, Venetian Bridge Battles. 
Known locally as Battaglia de Pugni, which means Battle of the Fists, this is something that's rooted deep within the local traditions of Venice, with the events often held on the most picturesque bridges. Dating back to the 17th century during a period of many historians argue was Venice at its peak, the confrontations involved members of rival neighborhoods that would meet on a designated bridge to settle disputes. The objective was straightforward. Each team tried to push their opponents off the bridge using a combination of tactics and brute force. Participants in bridge battles were usually ordinary Venetian citizens, including artisans, fishermen, and laborers, who were grouped by the neighborhood where they lived. They would also train intensely to prepare for these events that were not only about physical strength, but also about strategy. The fighters, known as the Forza, would often take part in these battles bare-fisted, and the events were known to be pretty violent, with injuries being commonplace. The bridges serving as the venues for these contests were stripped of any railings to make things simpler, with the sides of the bridge lined with wooden platforms to provide a fighting surface. The bridge battles were held regularly until the end of the 18th century when they were officially banned due to the excessive violence and the public disorder they often caused. The spirit and memory of the bridge battles, though, they have been preserved in Venetian culture, and they're occasionally reenacted today as part of historic festivals. These modern reenactments are, of course, non-violent and choreographed, designed more to celebrate Venetian history and culture than to resolve actual conflicts. Number 5. The Fisherman's Joust The Fisherman's Joust is a maritime sport that's rooted in the cultural heritage of coastal communities in France, particularly in Provence. The sport, which first took place in medieval times, is everything you'd expect from jousting, except it takes things up a level by taking place on boats. In the Fisherman's Joust, two teams of jousters meet on the water, each aboard a traditional wooden boat that are moved by oarsmen. The boats are specially designed and decorated for the occasion, normally brightly painted and coated in the colors and emblems of the teams. The jousters are equipped with a wooden shield and a lance, and they wear protective clothing. As the boats approach one another, guided by the rowers, silence typically falls over the spectators. The tension then breaks with the first clash of the lances against the shields, often followed by the splash of a jouster falling into the water. The victor is the one who remains standing on the platform, and the points are awarded based on technique, force, and the outcome of the encounter. These kind of events draw large crowds with locals and tourists alike, accompanied by music, food stalls, and other activities. The Fisherman's Joust is as much a community festival as it is a competitive sport. Historically, though, there was more to the meaning behind these jousts, as it was a demonstration of the fishermen's skill and strength, and today the events like this still take place in several towns along the French Mediterranean. These modern competitions follow rituals that have been passed down through the generations, and are as traditional as possible, even including the blessing of the boats and a parade of jousters through the town. Number 4. Pasakwa Kohuag Pasakwa Kohuag was one of the lesser-known Native American ball games that was played in the northeast of the United States, particularly in what is now known as Rhode Island. The name itself, which comes from the Narragansett language, means together they play ball with the foot and was actually quite similar to modern soccer. There were some major differences, though. Rather than having a strict limit on the number of players, this sport could actually have as many as hundreds of participants taking place at the same time. The area would also naturally include obstacles and varied terrain that had to be played around, and the sheer size and scale of a match meant that it was a community event that could, at the time, keep going for days. Pasakwa Kohuag was a physically demanding sport, testing the endurance and agility and skill of the players who needed to kick a small, hard ball made of stuffed deer hair or similar materials in the opposing team's goal, which could be designated by natural fences such as trees or stones. And the rules were relatively simple, using feet or moving the ball and banning the use of your hands entirely. Often played to give thanks for bountiful harvests, to celebrate tribal festivals, or as a non-lethal way to settle disputes between tribes, it faded from practice as Europeans began to colonize the continent and the traditional Native American lifestyles became increasingly disrupted. In recent times, though, there have been efforts to revive and preserve sports like these, and while the games of this size that used to be played are virtually impossible, smaller versions are regularly played to ensure the tradition isn't forgotten. Number 3. Nomachia Nomachia, which translates to mean naval combat, was probably the most overtop ancient sport of all, so much so that it's difficult to believe that it was even possible. 
Originating in ancient Rome as a way to celebrate the Roman Navy's conquest abroad and as imperial propaganda to reinforce the idea of a strong empire, the events were staged as sea battles with competitive elements and were the talk of the town, with visitors traveling from across the empire to witness them. The first recorded event was organized by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, and to begin with, they were held in natural or artificial basins and lakes, some of which were constructed for this purpose. Augustus and later emperors continued this tradition, hosting their own to celebrate victories or commemorate significant occasions. And over time, the battles became more elaborate, involving thousands of combatants, many of whom were prisoners of war, slaves, or condemned criminals. Because of the scale of these events, Nomachie required significant logistical planning. Augustus, for example, constructed a huge artificial lake right on the bank of the Tiber, but perhaps the most ambitious of all took place under Domitian, where the Colosseum itself was filled with seawater. The ships were scale models of the ones used by the Navy, and the participants wore armor, and for those involved, it played out as a real way a military battle would. Audiences would see full-scale naval encounters complete with ramming, boarding actions, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. The battles were fiercely realistic, and it was this blend of real danger and spectacle that made them such a unique form of entertainment. They were extremely popular, but the logistical and sheer cost of staging these events eventually led to their decline. Number 2. Minoan Bull Leaping Thanks to the legend of the Minotaur, the ancient Greek community on the island of Crete has forever been associated with the bulls. But while the part bull, part man may be a creature of fiction, the Minoans certainly revered bulls and had unusual sports that celebrated the animals in a very different way to the fights and chases you see today. Bull leaping became popular around 3400 years ago and would involve athletes performing acrobatic stunts over the backs of charging bulls. The depictions of these events on frescoes, such as the ones in the palace complex at Knossos, provide a glimpse into the significance of bulls within the Minoan culture and the exciting nature of the sport. The most famous artwork of bull leaping is in the Torre do Fresco, where participants, both male and female, are shown grabbing the bulls by the horns and performing flips over their backs. The Minoans' bull leaping was probably much more than just a sport and would have had a deep religious significance. Bulls were associated with fertility and various gods, so the acts of leaping over a bull likely represented a human overcoming or harnessing the power of higher beings. With only imagery as a reference and no written records, archaeologists and historians don't exactly agree on how bull leaping events worked. Some suggest that the bulls used in Minoan Crete, such as aurochs, were smaller and perhaps more docile than their wild counterparts which might have made the dangerous sport slightly more possible. Still, you'd have needed to be athletic and brave to take on that challenge, and the best at this sport were highly revered people. Number 1. Heeholua When you think of sports in Hawaii today, you're probably reaching for your surfboard and ready to take to the waves, but this isn't close to the most extreme sport on the islands. Heeholua, which is also called lava sledding, is an ancient and sacred sport that was practiced by the native people long before Western contact. It involved riding a narrow wooden sled down a steep stone or grassy slope at high speed, with the most daring sledders choosing to slide down the sides of volcanoes amongst the lava flows. The sleds used in the sport, which are called papaholua, were sophisticated pieces of engineering, typically made from the wood of native trees like koa or ulu. These sleds could be up to 12 feet long and were mounted on two narrow runners, which reduced friction and allowed for much greater speed. Slopes, or holua slides, were prepared ahead of events and were constructed near sacred sites, being considered sacred themselves. These slides could be over a mile long and built out of lava rock and lined with grass to provide a smoother ride. Constructing and maintaining them was a communal effort, although it was mainly the Hawaiian nobility who would slide as a way to demonstrate their bravery. The highlight of the Hee Hulua calendar was during Makahiki, a festival dedicated to the god Lono, which celebrated the harvest season. Participants would prepare through prayer and rituals, and the event would draw spectators from across the islands. Riders lying on their sleds would use their hands to steer and balance as they hurtled down the slopes. The speeds were really high and the risk of injury was significant, making mastery of Heeholua a respected and admired skill. It was not uncommon for riders to be seriously injured, which added to the sport's sacredness and the honor given to those who were the best. 
Despite its significance in Hawaiian culture, Heiheulua faded away during the 19th century because of the Western suppression of Hawaiian culture. There has, though, been a resurgence of interest in the sport in recent times, along a wider revival of Hawaiian culture and practices. Organizations have worked to restore old hulua slides and construct new ones, ensuring that the knowledge and traditions of Heiheulua are passed on, and it remains an exhilarating event to see. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.